So, uh, good morning. Today we will uh, start to discuss renormalization of uh, non maps. And I forgot to write down a reference for this. So, uh, on my web page, let me. You can go there and you will find somewhere uh, a survey. And so on, on the results we are going to discuss today and, uh, and tomorrow. Um, inside there you will find also many references for the, the material that we discussed uh, the, the, the other days. Um, okay. So let's recall what was going on. So we looked at uh, first, uh, now we start to look at two-dimensional maps. So let's recall what happened in one-dimensional maps. And how was it again? We had our little unimodal family where the tip parameterizes, is parameterized by the, and then you have the family which, which grows like that. And then we made uh, a diagram describing the dynamics. And you know how it goes. And so initially, for small values of t, we see a periodic point attractor. Then at some point, we see a period two point uh, occurring, and then at some point we will start to see a period four attractor, and and that will continue like that up to the limiting value, and that is the boundary of chaos. And so this picture describes the period doubling. Cascade to chaos. And there were two observations we made, we, dis we, we, we discussed. And the first one was there is parameter universality. And that means that. The, the, the moments where you see the period doubling happening converges to the boundary, and that goes exponentially fast, and the rate is 1 over, and remember the unstable eigenvalue of renormalization at the fixed point. And, and that rate is independent of the specific family you choose. So, and that refers to the behavior in the parameters is something universal. So, then there was another universality aspect. So, if you have this, initially you have, the, you have an attracting fixed point, and that when it bifurcates, it still consists and it moves, it persists up to the boundary of chaos. So, in our map at the boundary of chaos, there is a fixed point. But there is also a continuation of the period two point. And, there, and it continues like this. There will also be in the limit a period uh, a four, eight point. And this will continue, accumulate at P infinity. And then there's also uh, phase space universality. And so that refers to uh, phase spaces where the dynamics happens. So there is some universal behavior in, in the, posi the geometrical positions of this, of this periodic orbit. And what you see is that this Pn converges to P infinity. And again, that goes exponential. 
And the rate is 1 over sigma squared, which is like 1 over 2.6 squared. And again, the accumulation of these periodic orbits at their limit does not depend on the family, and that refers to the universality. <clears throat> okay. And then, um, related to, to the specific accumulation of the periodic orbits, there was even a stronger result, and that was the virginity. If you have two of those infinitely renormalizable maps, which are at the accumulation of pure doubling, then the two of them will have a counter attractor. We discussed this yesterday. And this is the counter attractor of F. And G will also have a, a counter attractor. And there will be a conjugation between them. And this conjugation will be C1 and a little bit. And so the conjugation on the counter set, on the attract is smooth. And that means that it's not only that these periodic points are positioned in a universal way, but all the fine structure in this, in this counter set in F is also present in the other one. And so the fine geometrical structure of these counter attractors is universal. And so we have like a lot of geometrical and sort of surprising uh, uh, universality. And wh why is it surprising? So let's go back to our diagram. So this time I make it big, because something, something else happens. So, so the main conclusion so, in, so the only thing we, we know from this picture is topological information. We only know that, that our family is going to a pair doubling cascade. That is topological information. And we know at the limit we have topological information and the map is infinite renormalizable. So from this picture, this picture is constructed out of purely topological information. So, but then apparently we get a lot of geometrical information. So, and, and that is where the strength and the, the, the the, 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 the force of renormalization occurs. So the main conclusion is that topology gives you geometry. So this is sort of the paradigm of renormalization theory. You, get, you give very poor information, only topological information, and out of that you get much more information, and very precise geometrical information. So let's see what it means. And so before, like the whole course is sort of based on this diagram, and the idea was that, that the renormalization is like a, a tool which, which allows you to give a, uni, unify, a, a unified description of the topological aspects of the dynamics, the geometrical aspects of the dynamics, the measure theory of the dynamics, and the bifurcation theory of the dynamics. And so and at this moment, the only thing is that it's a nice tool which sort of allows you to describe all those things. So it's not very interesting. It's nice, it's useful. And it, but now there is something else in this picture which we didn't know before. Actually, this renormalization causes these connections that most of the picture is actually coming just out of the topology. And, and the fact that this happens is behind, the, the fact behind this strong 
conclusions is the hyperbolicity of this renormalization operator. So, and that is something you couldn't do before. And so, these implications is the strength of renormalization. Okay. So, this is the picture in one, and two, uh, in one dimension in the circle diffeomorphism case and in the uh, unimodal case. Yeah. Now, for example, like at the boundary of chaos, we know that our maps are infinitely renormalizable. So that is purely topological information. It's exchanging two intervals, and then again and again. It's purely topological combinatorial information. Let me, let me rephrase it as combinatorial information. Uh, or in the case of the circle diffeomorphisms, uh, we had information uh, like in, when F is a diffium, and then we looked at the case where all the ANs are one. As, uh, so that means the rotation number was golden ratio. So that is purely combinatorial information. But out of that, we proved that the conjugation with the Fibonacci rot rigid rotation is, is smooth. Yeah, of course, of course. But that is very soft ge uh, geometrical information. If you only give, and so this whole picture doesn't exist in a C1 world. But if your world, it's a very, good, a very important question. Uh, all these phenomena, they only occur when the systems have enough smoothness. And they definitely do not occur when you have very low smoothness. Uh, but we believe that nature is smooth. Yeah. <laughs> and so we, we don't, let's not worry about C1 world. Let's worry about higher smoothness world. And, and then this universality phenomena occur. And for example, this number, uh, this, this eigenvalue is observed in nature. Uh, there are experiments in, in mechanical chaos or in, even in fluid dynamics and in electrical chaos, in electrical circuit chaos, and they measure, if they observe a pure Dublin cascade, combinatorial information in some electrical circuit, then they see again 4.6. And so there is something going on. There is, there is something going on. And so, so far we have been talking only about one dimensions, but pieces of this one dimensional picture, which is a very, uh, like these unimodal maps, and nobody believes that this is a realistic model of anything in nature. And so, I mean, this, for the moment, this is just a toy. But it's, maybe something is going on, because this number is measured. And so, on one hand, it is a toy, but there is something going on. And we are, now we are going to two dimensions, and two dimensions is still not a realistic model of anything in nature, but it's, it's a little less naive. So we get a little bit more realistic. So let's go to two dimensions. So what is a non map? So a non maps, they have something to do with homoclinic tangencies. And like in the course last week, you learned that. Uh, that pictures like this, so we have, say, a saddle point here with an expanding direction and a contracting direction. And it could be that the, that the, the unstable manifold is tangent to the stable manifold. And, and last week you learned that, that this type of pictures are associated with topological changes. Of, of many types. But let's look at this picture. And now let's see where this non-map comes from. 
So what you can do is, you can take a very tiny box here. I, I make it big, but it's a very tiny box and, and very close to the tangency. So then you will see it, you iterate a couple of times. It gets a little thinner and higher and you iterate a couple of times and it gets even thinner and higher and you iterate a couple of times and it gets really thin and long and then eventually it will get something back like that. And so this little box, after a couple of iterates, it will come, the, the, the rectangle box will come back to a bubble like that. And so and now we are interested in, in bifurcating these tangencies. And so what we want to do is we want to take the map and push uh, this, this, this unstable manifold a little bit up. And then what you will see here, uh, let's zoom out. So let's zoom out what you see here. And what you see is up to a smooth change of coordinates. You see a map F, and this is like Fn restricted to this uh, little cube, but then uh, rescaled, rescaled with a smooth coordinate change, then you get a map which has this form. It has this form, um, where, where this F is something is something unimodal like that, and this epsilon is something very tiny. So this epsilon has to do, if we are considering the situation where the determinant of our system, say, is positive and is very tiny. And now you see if I have very high iterate, So, so the map from here to here will be very area contracting and that will be reflected in the fact that this epsilon is very tiny. So this is very tiny. So you, what, this, what this Hanon map is, and what this Hanon map is, it's like, So, so our, uh, the, the Hanon maps we are going to look at, our Hanon maps are strongly dissipative. And that means that this epsilon is very tiny. And why is it called dissipative? Now you can check that if you look at the Jacobian of f, which is the determinant of the derivative, that is like d epsilon uh, dy. And you see that it's very tiny. So in particular, and, and that's sort of, you would say that's good news, that they are perturbations of unimodal maps. And so this is, this is the simple way you can remember them. It's so just, just, you have this unimodal map and sort of you make, turn it into something two dimensional. So to be precise, uh, the theorems which, which we are going to discuss today, 
they, they use that these maps have holomorphic extensions and quadratic like holomorphic extensions and these epsilons are also holomorphic functions. <coughs> okay, but let's not worry about that. Okay. Maybe let's keep this a little bit on the blackboard. It is, it is so crucial. So an example. Here is the Hanon family. And that is given by a very simple formula. And you will see immediately that it is a perturbation of, of, a, of, a, of a unimodal map is just given by something a minus x square minus by x. It is just a formula. And you see that b is the Jacobian of the derivative. The, uh, oh, the Jacobian of f, sorry. So and, and this family has been around since early 80s, I think, late 70s. And up to today, we, it is, uh, I think you can easily say, poorly understood. However, um, this is my opinion. I think this family deserves very serious attention. And the reason is, so the reason is that, this is also my personal opinion, I think that all, I think that the deepest phenomena we know in dynamics occur in this family. Let, let me show you a little bit what is going on. And so here we have A and here we have B. And so if B is zero, and you see the Y coordinate, it's, it's just one dimensional dynamics. And so for B is zero, we understand everything very well. But now we go up a little bit. So here is the point where we have like this map. And I will, I will not describe exactly what, what we know there, but there is a piece of information here, and let me uh, summarize that as the Benedict's Carlson uh, fact uh, theorem. Uh, in this area, around perturbations of this map, we have very precise information about the, the statistical behavior of things and, and about the parameter dependence. It's an extremely sophisticated piece of math. Um, then here, so here, here we now have we have like full, full entropy. It's like full. so, and here is also a piece of information about the topology, and let me call that. Uh, it's obtained by Bedford and Smiley. And then also somewhere here there is a phenomenon. These are all very tiny pieces. Oh, this is actually a big piece. Is the Newhouse phenomenon. And then in this type of families, there is also, if you are at the case where B is 1, you, let's think about the conservative type as the determinant is 1. <coughs> there is the blob of the KAM theorem. Oh, I should make that like that. As in the purely conservative area, there is KEM theory, uh, the Kolmogorov Arnold Moser uh, phenomenon. Um, and then there is this little thing here where we have the boundary of chaos. 
and this is the point we have been discussing, like where the little. Uh, so if you if you look here, in, you will see uh, our little little thing happening, and there is a little curve here, and this is indeed the boundary of chaos. And and today and tomorrow, we are only going to discuss this little area, and this boundary of chaos. That is the subject of today and, and tomorrow. Uh, but I, I made the blobs big, but the whole family is still very poorly understood. There's still a lot of uh, uh, dark pieces. Um, okay. Okay, so let's So let's start to take maps which are close to, to our one-dimensional, infinitely renormalizable maps. So we expect that to understand this area, we have to do pure doubling renormalization. So let's, say, let's discuss when a map like this is renormalizable. A handon like map is renormalizable <laughs> if the following happens. So again, we, we want to say what renormali renormalizable is in purely topological sense. And what we have been doing uh, like the whole last week and, and again. So we want a topological definition of what renormalization is. And I, I, I make a picture and you see what happens. What we want is there exists some fixed point, and that fixed point has some stable manifold, and there is somewhere else a fixed point, and what we want is that this is a shallow point, and we want that the unstable manifold of, of the first fixed point goes around, comes back, and then it doesn't stick out. So before it goes again through the stable manifold of this, this second fixed point, it turns around and it comes back like that. And so if you have a picture like that, then you say that the corresponding handon map is renormalizable. And, and that makes sense, because if you take this box here, and you remember, renormalization is about choosing a piece preferably topologically defined, and look at the first return map. So the piece we are going to choose, maybe I'd use a color. And so this is our U, the piece of the stable manifold, the piece of, of the unstable manifold, and so this is our, let's say, let's call it D in this case, and that piece is mapped to that one. And it is mapped just in two maps, in two iterates. So what happens is that the red blob is going here, and then it is folded back inside here. So if you have a picture like that, you say that the Hanon map is renormalizable. And then you do the usual thing, and you take this picture, and you rescale, and then we have this blob, and, uh, and here is, this is like a risk of fur, and here we will see our renormalization. And this is like a risk of version of the second iterate restricted to our piece. Okay. <laughs> so this is a problem, and, and we were not able to do it in this way. Um, uh, at the end of the story, 
we will be able to go back to this purely topological definition and, and describe renormalization with this purely topological definition. But the way it is done is not by a topological definition. In the end, it is the same, but in the, as, formally it's not a topological definition. So let me explain you. It's a little technical, but it is going to play a major role. So usually, so, so far, our rescalings has been affine. Have been affine maps. And because you, you, if you, 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 want, you want to look, it's a microscope. So you just want to look. You don't want to see, you want to have good lenses in your microscope. You don't want to distort what you're looking at. And so this is a natural thing. But there is a problem with that. And we will be forced to use diffeomorphisms here. And then you get a lot, we'll see where it comes from. <coughs> so the shape And the formula is this, eh? fxy is some unimodal thing and something epsilon depending on y, and then here is an x. So we haven't been writing down a lot of formulas in the last two weeks, but, but this formula, and in particular this part, the <laughs> trivial part, plays a major role in the analysis. And a lot of the phenomena we are going to see is coming from this. <laughs> Looks very innocent, but it's not. So let me make a picture of this X. And it's obvious, if you take your X here, and you take a vertical line, so you take X is constant, then that will map, be mapped to a horizontal line. And so this horizontal line will be mapped to something horizontal. And, and the length of this thing is like d epsilon dy, which is very tiny. And so this big horizontal vertical line is contracted a lot and then put horizontally down. And so the picture you get is something like, you get something like that. Sorry, we get something like that. And so our Hanon map does something like this. And what is important is it takes the vertical foliation and it turns it horizontal. And so the, the vertical foliation is becoming horizontal. The vertical foliation goes to horizontal. And so this, this characterizes what Hanon maps are. That, that's this X. And so and now, now you see immediately that there is a problem. And because and so to say it again, a Hanon map is characterized by the fact that vertical foliations go to horizontal foliations. But the renormalization is a second iterate. And so it is very unlikely that you take the, the, the that the renormalization is again of of the vertical to horizontal shape. And because it is a second iterate, so you take your, your vertical foliation, it is mapped to something horizontal, but it is a diffeomorphism. So the second time you iterate, only the vertical goes horizontal, so the vertical will not become horizontal. 
And so the problem is that, that our second iterate, which is supposed to be the renormalization, is not a Hanon map. And so there will be no affine rescaling, which will turn this thing into, into a Hanon map. So we are forced to forget about affine rescalings and use diffeomorphisms to rescale. And so this forces us to use diffuse as rescalings. And so and now you see it, 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 it becomes there's some analysis coming in. So the, the actual definition, uh, the definition of renormalizable has a, 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 an analytical part aspect. In the end, it really doesn't play a role, but in the definition it does. So let me make a picture of a renormalizable map. Um, okay, so we say that our F is renormalizable if the following happens. So there is a sort of a rectangle here. And this, let's call this B, V1. And that is mapped to sort of a bent rectangle here. And let's call that B1C. And that is mapped back. And it is mapped back to, uh, to something, to something, uh, to something like that. And so this is going to be our domain of renormalization. And the, the, the second iterate will, will bring this back. So and now there is something important. So the, the second iterate will not bring vertical, vertical to horizontal. But if you have, yeah. Now, you know, you're, you're right. You're right. Even if it's relaxed, I still Yeah. You know, like the, the ones which are coming from homoclinic bifurcations can be written in this form. And having this form, having this form will allow us to do the analysis. And the analysis is going to be a little technical and, and delicate. But somehow, this stupid formula is responsible for major consequences. So, so we want to be convenient. not only convenient, it's, it's su sufficient. Because the, the interesting maps, the ones which are coming out of homoclinic bifurcations, are of this form. So these are the ones we want to understand, exactly these ones. A bit you're right, you, you can shuffle a little bit. But you can always bring it back to this shape. And other, another thing is, our maps are perturbations of unimodal maps. And the fact that they are perturbations allow you to always bring it back to this form. So it sounds like a very strict restriction, but it's not at all. Not at, so th this, is, this is what you have to do. Okay, <clears throat> and so let's go back to the definition of renormalizable. And we want to have a, a sort of a rectangle which goes here and comes back. But we want something more, and, and you get that there will be some foliation here. And if you take, and these are not, if you take one of these leaves of the foliation, they will be mapped to something horizontal. 
And so up to the foliation, you see a non-map. So what you have to do is, you have to straighten this, and I write this big because these guys are going to be important. And so the, the scaling uh, is called psi 1 v, and uh, I go sort of going, zooming in. It is just defined by straightening the foliation. And so we have our, our foliation which becomes horizontal, and you just straighten that. Maybe I should do the perfectly vertical foliation. And, and this leaf here will become uh, one of those leaves here. And that leaf will become horizontal, and so it will be mapped to something like that by the renormalization. So this is the picture of the renormalization of F. So formally, so I will not bore you with, but you can just write down a formula, an extremely explicit formula of this diffeomorphism in terms of, of this usual an exercise. You can write accentures like one formula and you get this straightening map. It's nothing mysterious. And what it will also do, it, it really, like this psi, I can sort of write it down, of x, y. It is something, y stays fixed, up to some, and then here it is fx minus epsilon x, y. And then there is some scaling. And so it, is, it, it looks complicated, but it is just an explicit formula for how you should do the scaling. Excuse me? No, it's y. And now it is a y. And that reflects the fact that if you take a horizontal line, it will go to some horizontal line. And, and it looks very innocent, but the fact that horizontal lines go to horizontal lines indicates that in the scaling, there is a one-dimensional dynamics going on. It's like intervals to intervals. And so all the analysis, let's not get technical, but all the analysis is going to sit into these diffeomorphisms. And it has a very one-dimensional nature. And we know how to do one-dimensional dynamics. But uh, let's go slow. Why did you write psi pi? It's psi 1. You will see. It's psi 1. Ah, okay. It's not the same psi. Oh, sorry. It's, this, it's, it's psi 1. Okay. And the 1 refers to the first renormalization. Okay. No. Yeah, you can easily. You know, if you uh, if you take your oops, if you take your your unimodal map, it will have some pieces which are exchanged. And 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 this box here is sort of living above this interval. So these are really big box, they have nice sizes, and, and this, this foliation is almost a vertical foliation. And we, we are working with our epsilon, very tiny. And these boxes, they are really nice boxes. And these diffeomorphisms, these are nice diffeomorphisms. Yeah. Oh, maybe, maybe I'm sort of, maybe about, you know, I, should, I think I should write the inverse here. In the inverse, F comes here. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, you're right, you're right. <laughs>
But at this, at this moment, it really doesn't matter. It is an, uh, the point is that using this, this rescaling, we can write down a formula for our renormalization, and that will be of this shape, inverse. Or, uh, no. Yeah, stop, pop, and back. Yeah, so this is the... Formula is always dangerous. You should never write down formulas. Um, okay. Excuse me? Yeah, so what you do is, uh, what you want to have a piece which returns into itself. That's what you want as a domain of renormalization. Then the second condition is, you want the top and the bottom to be horizontal. And you want to be the sides to be part of the foliation which becomes horizontal. And then you say, take the smallest one of such boxes which are mapped into itself. And so the boxes at that moment become uniquely defined, and the scaling also becomes uniquely defined. So everything is absolutely, uh, precisely defined. Okay? So at some stage you have to put in some conditions on the Jacob. Yeah, so in the whole story, I remember, if you are in the Hanon situation, and, and B is, is here, and, and we are really looking at a very tiny part. So everything we know, in, of, of almost everything we know about Hanon maps is, is happening in, in, for, for very small Jacobians. And we are in the beginning of the theory, so it's, it's all a perturbative theory. Yeah, that's, that's how it is. You have to be modest at this point. Yeah, so, so the analysis is something. And so, so this has to be a unimodal map. And we want it to be holomorphic, quadratic-like. So here we have, like, the unimodal maps. Somewhere here, we have the fixed point of renormalization. And then there is a neighborhood, which is something like that. And, and maps in this neighborhood will, will satisfy where we can work. So it's, it is, it's not a, a, the theory we are going to describe is not something which only occurs around the fixed point. It is a global theory. But if you take a very bad unimodal map sitting somewhere here, you have to take your epsilon smaller. And, and the only reason to take this epsilon small is that we want to have this foliation nicely. If you have a unimodal map and you let the epsilon go up, this foliation becomes crazy. And, and we don't want that. And so there is... I don't know, I don't know. It's not like ridiculously small. It's, it's, some, it's not like 10 to the minus 20 or something. It is it's something. The only, so... Something. It's some number, a reasonable number. I, I don't know. Okay, so... Okay, so... <clears throat> so now we have our... We defined precisely after some discussion how you renormalize, and now we have our renormalization operator, and let me write down what we know about this operator. And you will not be surprised. You will not be surprised at all. Carvalho, Michal Lubitsch, 
and myself. And there is a similar result, but uh, relating a different renormalization scheme by Collet, Ekman, and, and Koch. Um, and so they, they did something slightly, it's a similar result, but we needed to do, we couldn't use the Collet Ekman Koch renormalization scheme because it didn't allow us to do, to study the geometry. Things degenerated too much in this scheme. So that's why we, we were forced to do, we wanted to go to, to rigidity, so we, need, we, couldn't, we couldn't use, unfortunately, we couldn't use this previous work. So, and the theorem is obvious. Um, so, there exists a unique fixed point, F star, and it is just this. And so it is just where, where this one is the unimodal fixed point. It is just unimodal. And so what the fixed point of renormalization, of her non-renormalization, is a degenerate Hernon map. It is just equivalent to, 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 to the thing. And then what we know about this, F star is hyperbolic. Um, the unstable manifold is exactly the unstable manifold in the one-dimensional space. And the stable manifold is co-dimension is one. And so this is just the hyperbolic picture. <clears throat> no, you know, so, so these maps that is the first part of the analysis, that these maps are in some compact family. And we will actually per se exactly how they behave. There will be some asymptotic diffeomorphism. And so these guys. And it's sort of interesting. There will be a universal limiting scaling. So now if the, if the original map has some Jacobian, then the second iterate will have, of course, Jacobian squared. So, and now this scaling is some compact diffeomorphism. So, the Jacobian here will be of the order some constant times b squared. So, it's not possible to No, 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 no. These are very nice diffeomorphisms. And they are really nice diffeomorphisms. And we will come to that. So, all, all the phenomena we are going to see are related to to the asymptotic behavior of the scalings. It's, it's very, it all goes sort of around. But no, there is no problem. But the thanks for the question, because here you also see that you start with a map with Jacobian B, and the next map has Jacobian B squared. So if you start to renormalize, what happens is that if you start to renormalize, this thing is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. So in the limit, it has to be some one-dimensional object. And so you know uh, that, that the limits of renormalization, uh, they, they, they are, they are, they are one-dimensional maps. And that is exactly your question, the consequence of your question. Oh. Yeah, one moment, we will get there. We will get, no, no, you, you will see. Hopefully to, let, let me move on, let me go on, okay? You will see, no, no, it's going to be very two-dimensional. <clears throat> so, 
And, and, but you know, your question is just very much to the point. Hey, we start with a one-dimensional map, and we take small perturbations of one-dimensional dynamics, so everything should be the same. It's just pertur perturbation of one-dimensional dynamics. So we expect to see just the one-dimensional picture. And the one-dimensional picture in topological sense, but also in geometrical sense. So all the universality things we saw in the period doubling cascade should show up here also. And the parameter universality, and that is going to happen because people measure this in nature. But also the phase space universality, accumulation of the periodic points, and maybe also the rigidity. And so like, when, we, when we started to work on this, we just thought this has to be done, but it's not going to be interesting. But it, we, we cannot not do this. But it is going to be boring. And, and you see, it is boring. It is just a one-dimensional picture. There's nothing new here. And, and, and um, like out of this, you, I can make the picture, but out of this you can, you can, uh, yeah, you can out of this hyperbolic picture, uh, what you will see is, so here we have our renormalization fixed point, and out of that there will be some piece of this stable manifold, I can make the picture, but you, you can get the... So there's a little intersection here of the stable manifold of the fixed point, and that are the infinite renormalizable guys, and that is also the boundary of chaos. And if you take a little b here, then you will see again accumulation of pair doubling, and in this case the Tn is again controlled by the same same eigenvalue, because everything on small scale is going to look like the unstable manifold of, of the so parameter universality. From, from this theorem we get parameter universality. And this part is a theorem by Nam. So this part continues in higher and higher dimensions. So if you take, this was a two-dimensional perturbation of a unimodal map. If you go to uh, ten-dimensional perturbations of unimodal maps, you still see parameter universality, uh, according the, using the same scheme. It will just continue. So no problem. Every, and this is what people measure. Uh, so in nature, people measure this, and, and, and this theorem from Naam explains why, why that happens. So we are running out of time. Um, I would like to show you a picture, because now everything is boring, so tomorrow you're not coming back. I would, so I would like to show you a picture as sort of a, hopefully, you, there is, um, this is boring, but there will be something surprising. And at the same moment, it is quite beautiful. So, um, can, can I use like five minutes, two minutes more to show you, explain you the picture? Is it okay? No, but F star. No, so, so like we, what we have is we have again something like this, eh? Here we have the space of non maps, and, and here we have our renormalization operator, and, and our map F star is a fixed point of this operator. It's, it's not, a, and, and, and in the sense of being a fixed point of this operator, of R, of R exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so this happens in, in an infinite domain. It's, it's dynamics of renormalization. No, no, the, like the, it's, it is became degenerate. It became like a unimodal map. And that has to do with Stefano's question uh, that, that the B is going to shrink down super exponentially fast. So, so all, all the two-dimensional things will disappear in the renormalizations. So that's why, why the fixed point has to be something one-dimensional. 
Oké? Okay? You know, do you allow like two minutes? So, so I would like to show you something about the dynamics, and then tomorrow we will get into the details of that. So, let's take, I should make that big, let's take this big, we have our map F here, and we have our blob here, and that blob is exchanged. And then we rescale this with our first map, and we see our renormalization. So psi v, we call this box b v, b v1, but we also will look at the map psi c, which is just, you compose one step further. And so psi v takes the unit square, puts it here, and then psi c puts it here. And so you get b c1. You see the picture? And so psi v gives you a scaling of one box, and psi c gives you a rescaling of, of the other box, which are going to be shuffled. So, but now, this guy is again renormalization, renormalizable, so it will have also a box, and there will be a second rescaling. And then there will also be a map here, and there will be the corresponding C scaling, which takes the box into here. So this is the cycle of the renormalization, but now we can take this cycle and put it inside here. And so you will get some blob here and another blob here, and then we can use this scaling to put these blobs inside here. And so you see the counter set appearing. And so now, initially we saw a cycle of two pieces, and now you see a cycle of four pieces. And now it continues, so this is a second renormalization. Again, there will be some blob here. And uh, now this, this, so these, these blobs, they will get in some inside here, and they will get somewhere inside here. But now this picture is getting somewhere inside here, somewhere inside here. And then these things are getting somewhere inside here and somewhere inside here. And so you see exactly the same construction as what we did in one dimensional dynamics. And you see and like, like what we, you know, remember we had the cycles. Eh? So C, C1 is the first cycle. And these are like these two pieces which are exchanged, and that contains the second cycle, and which are, which are, are these blobs, these four, they're like, they're like these blobs, and it continues like that. And this is the second cycle, and it continues like that. It continues forever like that. And then, of course, you have to take the intersection of those things, and that is a counter set. And that will be the counter attractor. And so inside, inside here, there will be a counter set, like in the unimodal case, and that counter set is going to attract almost every point. So now, yeah, yeah, it's topologically the same. It's exactly, you see, you see the picture. Like if you instead of making blobs, you take little lines, you can just the same exactly the same counter set as the unimodal ones. So and now let me make show you a picture. Let me first make uh, uh, two seconds. So if you would do this in 
in de one dimensional case, and then you would see your counter set sort of lying here. So this is F star. Eh? And now you can take a point here, and you can take the tangent line. That is the tangent line to the counter set in that point. And for, for the one dimensional picture. And that you can do in all those points. And you will see in the, in the, in the B is zero case, in the one dimensional case, you see that this, the, the tangent bundle, the tangent bundle of this counter set is just forming the envelope of the graph of F star. So it's a, it's a very simple, beautiful picture, a smooth picture. So let me show you the tangent bundle of, of this counter attractor. It's, it's upside down. It's so too. And so this, you should look at like that. So you should look like that. And you, and you see somehow, like the white part, and you see somehow some sort of an envelope. Yeah, but if you look, and you show the, so the white bubble is sort of like, like this thing. But you see also, like, like in the, there's like a lot of, a sort of a star thing going on. And so if you, if you, if you look, if you start to look somewhere here, you, you, your, your tangent lines are, are going to be sort of in all directions. And so this picture is an indication that something one dimensional is seriously wrong. So, uh, yeah. So this is the finite stage? The, the finite stage. Uh, th think about it as you have this infinite renormalizable map, there is this counter set, and in many points there is actually a tangent line. You can speak, this counter set has tangent lines in many points. And these are the tangent lines. If you want to be more precise, you can think about it as uh, the, the Lyapunov zero uh, critical directions. And so it is this. But forget about that. It is to describe. It means that the, the stars means that at very tiny scale, this counter set is turning like crazy. That is what this picture means. It is a very wild and turning turning picture. So it is becoming something two-dimensional. And then tomorrow, you, will, you might be surprised, but you can understand this. And it go to, tomorrow we go there. And the fun thing is, and, and that is surprising, the one-dimensional theory breaks down. It's not smooth at all. But you can understand this in a probabilistic sense. So suddenly, we had rigidity and we had universality which is very rigid, every geometry is like a platonic thing. And if you go to higher dimensions, it is not perfect anymore. It, be, it gets a probabilistic nature. And we will get to that tomorrow. So.